Learning about the tools of mechanical ventilation and how to apply them is essential for so many medical subspecialists as well as so many allied health professionals. Here in this video, we present the basics of mechanical ventilation, and this will act as a foundation for in subsequent videos, we'll build upon this to introduce more advanced topics. Thanks for watching and thanks for learning with us. Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. This is Nazir Habib. Uh, today, I would like to go over the basic management of the patient on mechanical ventilation and uh, monitoring of this patient appropriately. This is a very basic talk, and we will go into other topics with mechanical ventilation in my other talks. The objective of this talk is to identify a patient requiring mechanical ventilator support, initiate mechanical ventilation safely, identify appropriate monitoring on the intubated patient, identify modes of support on the ventilated patient, and recognize the complications rapidly once you initiate mechanical ventilation. The goals of mechanical ventilation are fairly obvious. You have to provide ventilator support and oxygenation. You must ensure that the patient is comfortable and use appropriate sedation, especially in the first 24 hours when the patient requires full support. Our job is to prevent complications initially and as the patient remains on mechanical ventilation. Weaning talk will also be provided later. Initially, when we provide mechanical ventilation, we must select the appropriate settings and the modes and also monitor the patient. And fortunately, most of the ventilators actually have ventilator monitoring modes, including anti-tidal CO2 available. Let's review some basic physiology first. The respiratory system ensures that there is adequate exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. In normal anatomy, our dead space is generally about 150 cc's, and we depend on normal lung function or alveolar ventilation, which depends on normal respiratory muscle function, primarily the diaphragm and accessory muscles. We also have acid-based disturbances often in the critically ill patient that requires us to intubate the patient. And this should be reviewed on the chemistry panel prior to intubating the patient, especially serum potassium. Also, I would recommend that you examine the patient very carefully prior to intubation and following intubation. Patient assessment is always necessary and of great importance. Look at the anatomy first. Is the patient obese? They have a difficult airway? Do they have a large neck? Do they have kyphoscoliosis? Might they have sleep apnea? Do we need to elevate the head of the bed or position the patient in a way that we can optimize mechanical ventilation? Also pay attention to the respiration rate and ventilator synchrony. The work of breathing, the respiratory muscles. What is the patient's mental status? Before, during, and after intubation, it is essential to monitor the patient's respiration rate, their O2 saturation, capnography, which is another lecture that I've given, as well as the cardiac rhythm and the cardiac status. I would also recommend that we review the chest x-ray findings prior to intubation, as well as following intubation. And what is the specific diagnosis that has led to the patient's intubation? This is crucial. Remember, there are three components of mechanical ventilation that we must determine. First of all, there may be lung pathology. Generally, the patient may have pneumonia, pulmonary edema, COPD, but that is not the only compartment that the mechanical ventilation is trying to improve the status. Mechanical ventilation also has to deal with chest wall stiffness, especially in the obese patient or a trauma patient, but the chest wall may be restricted by trauma, blood, pleural fluid. The third compartment we often don't pay attention to is the abdomen. These days, we see a lot of patients who have obesity or intra-abdominal pathologies, such as acute pancreatitis, abdominal compartment syndrome, or the patient has just returned from surgery. This may limit the diaphragmatic excursion quite significantly and may limit your tidal volume and increase your peak pressures and your plateau pressures. Let us discuss first the pathology in the lung that you might be dealing with. 
the patient may be intubated for COPD or asthma, where you might find the problem is bronchospasm, which causes airway resistance. Sometimes we are admitting patients with pneumonia, influenza, where the patient is suffering from non-compliant lungs or a stiff lung, which is ARDS. And I will cover this topic in a later talk. When we're trying to determine what component of the lung pathology we're dealing with, it is often best to check the plateau pressure as in this diagram. Peak pressure is at the top, and then when you hold the patient in inspiration, you measure the plateau pressure. If the plateau pressure is elevated, you're dealing with a non-compliant or a stiff lung. If the plateau pressure is much lower and you're dealing primarily with resistance, you're dealing with a patient with bronchospasm. So initially, when you start the patient on mechanical ventilation, I would recommend that we start the patient on 100% oxygen. After the airway is placed, we should check the end tidal CO2 as soon as possible and chest, check, check a chest X-ray after intubation and placing an NG tube. Must, must initiate adequate sedation. We should also be monitoring the O2 saturation, vital signs, as well as end tidal CO2 and cardiac monitor. We must then decide to initiate the mode, the respiration rate, and the amount of PEEP that we dial in. The tidal volume generally is six to eight milliliters per kilogram ideal body weight. This generally should not be exceeded. We may lower the tidal volume once we get some more data depending on whether we're dealing with a stiff lung or a resistant lung or a normal one. The modes of ventilation initially that you should consider is volume ventilation, where you're delivering a guaranteed tidal volume and the pressure is variable. Pressure will depend on whether the patient has stiff lungs or resistance lungs from secretions, obstruction, the patient may be biting the tube, or you may be dealing with bronchospasm. Many times we initiate mechanical ventilation with pressure control. Remember that when we dial in a pressure, the tidal volume is variable. And this occurs at any time. The patient may wake up or not be sedated or develop a mucus plug or bronchospasm. The tidal volume can diminish very rapidly or the patient may develop distress and increasing end tidal CO2. Therefore, in the pressure control mode, it is absolutely important that you set alarms appropriately so that the patient's tidal volume is maintained without any adverse effects. Also, it is important to remember that you need a longer eye time in pressure control to deliver adequate tidal volume. As the patient's respiration rate increases and the eye time decreases, the tidal volumes will diminish. The flow cycle pressure uh, ventilation is what's called pressure support, which is initiated by the patient and is terminated by the patient. The tidal volume is augmented by the patient's physiology determines that. And generally you dial in the pressure support to deliver adequate tidal volumes approximately 300 to 350 cc's. This is a weaning mode generally. Synchronized IMV is where the patient has a set rate, but the patient can breathe over the set rate at their own uh, rate. So here what we see is the patient's set rate of SIMV, which delivers a certain tidal volume that is determined by the machine. However, the patient may breathe at their own rate and at their own tidal volume. The problem with SIMV is that the tidal volumes can vary and may be too small to deliver adequate alveolar ventilation. Therefore, one generally adds pressure support to the SIMV so that the patient can get adequate tidal volume. Generally, SIMV is not a mode that we use in everyday critical care units for ventilator support any longer. The spontaneous modes are used for weaning. So generally what we do is we put the patient on CPAP. 
which is the amount of PEEP that you're dialing in, generally five to eight centimeters during a weaning trial. Then we augment the patient's tidal volume by dialing in a certain amount of pressure support. The amount of pressure support that we dial in during weaning is generally five to eight centimeters. And this augments the patient's tidal volume adequately to allow them to breathe comfortably prior to doing a blood gas. Generally, you want to ensure that the tidal volume delivered by the pressure support is around 300 cc's so that the patient gets adequate alveolar ventilation to maintain their acid base status. Volume ventilation, you generally have to check the plateau pressure after you intubate the patient. As I mentioned earlier, the plateau pressure is much more important than the peak pressure and is the determinant of ventilator-induced lung injury. <coughs> so as soon as one is intubated and the patient is sedated and usually paralyzed at this time, it is very important to determine the plateau pressure as this will tell you also what is wrong with the lung uh, pathology, whether you're dealing with a resistant lung or a stiff lung. So as we can see in this diagram, when you hold the patient in inspiration, you determine the peak pressure. But what is more important is the plateau pressure or the P plateau. As if this patient has a higher than 30 centimeter plateau pressure, <coughs> you're probably dealing with stiff lungs. If the plateau pressure is low, then you're probably dealing with bronchospasm. A very important part of taking care of a patient following intubation, especially when they have very rapid respiration rate or large tidal volume, is they may develop air trapping. This is called intrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP. This is especially common in patients with COPD or bronchospasm. This air trapping can be disastrous. Initially, one sees hypotension, and as the patient's perfusion to the lung gets worse from dead space, they develop hypoxemia, the end tidal CO2 starts dropping, and the PCO2 may be very high. Please refer to my capnograph talk for further discussion regarding this topic. The next step that happens is the patient's respiration rate and heart rate increases, and the blood pressure gets worse, and this may lead to a cardiac arrest from PEA or asystole. It may also cause a pneumothorax. Treatment of this should be instituted immediately. Generally, one would recommend to disconnect the patient from mechanical ventilation, initiate sedation if it has not already been initiated, or increase the sedation and lower the respiration rate and tidal volume. It is of absolute importance that we pay attention to auto peep, as I've seen many patients have very adverse effects from uh, mechanical ventilation, especially when they have COPD and pneumonia. Sedation is critical. The ideal sedative should be short-acting, relieve anxiety, and have minimum hemodynamic effects. One should always consider the patient's pain and discomfort. Also, is the patient at risk of delirium or already have delirium, such as the old patient, patients with stroke, dementia, alcoholic, etc. We must recognize the complications of sedation. And at present time, it is very difficult to recommend an ideal sedative. So we will use the sedation recommended by the Society of Critical Care Medicine. These protocols are titrated and they may be uh, used by the nurse or the RT to ensure that the patient has adequate sedation, especially at night, to avoid ventilator asynchrony, as this may also lead to delirium if the patient is not adequately sedated at night. The patient should undergo daily sedation vacation whenever the patient is stable and a spontaneous breathing trial, as we want to avoid prolonged sedation and reduce the length of stay on mechanical ventilation. Sedation options as recommended by the Society of Critical Care Medicine is what I will review. First of all, it is important to titrate the sedation to a sedation scale. The RAS scale is generally used and one should aim for a negative one or two. I generally recommend fentanyl infusion or boluses and start propofol infusion 
generally for short-term sedation. This may cause hypotension and may cause increased triglyceride level after several days, as well as acidosis. Generally, we want to avoid infusions of benzodiazepine unless you are dealing with alcohol withdrawal or seizures. Generally, Presidex infusion is reserved for patients with delirium, and it's best when the patient is ready to wean. Intermittently, the patient may need boluses of fentanyl or morphine, especially when they are having rapid respiration rate, gasping or asynchronous breathing to ensure that the patient is accommodating mechanical ventilator support. Neuromuscular blockers may also be required, but it is important to note that the patient should be sedated first and document the scale of sedation prior to initiating neuromuscular blocker. The general indication is ARDS in the first 24 or 48 hours you must control the tidal volume and initiate a neuromuscular blocker. Same with asthmatic, they may require a neuromuscular blocker to avoid auto peep and rapid respiration rate. The recommendation is to use short term neuromuscular blocker. Cisatricurium is the medication recommended by the Society of Critical Care Medicine for many reasons. First of all, it is very rapid acting and does not require renal or hepatic function or its degradation, and it may have some anti-inflammatory properties. One must get arterial blood gas within 30 minutes. Three components of arterial blood gas is to evaluate the pH, which reflects the acid-base disorder that you're dealing with. The PCO2 reflects the ventilation, and the PO2 reflects lung function or alveolar function. And patient has a very large shunt or low PF ratio. Our goal is to maintain O2 sets at least 88 to 90 percent, generally in that range. We must maintain a safe pH, which most authorities consider a pH greater than 7.2, with exceptions. We must obtain a blood gas within 30 minutes after intubation and discuss with our physician next steps in the settings of the mechanical ventilation. Once in a while, we may perform permissive hypercapnia, where we may have very low minute ventilation, which allows the PCO to rise, sometimes to very high levels. This is generally used in patients with asthma, COPD, and ARDS, and generally we would aim for a pH greater than 7.1, which is considered safe with the exceptions of patients with head injury, intracerebral bleed, or hyperkalemia. This is a short talk on basics of mechanical ventilation, and we'll conclude by saying that mechanical ventilation has many complications. We must ensure proper training and education, supervision of staff, use appropriate monitoring, including end tidal CO2 or capnography, and please ensure that the alarms are set to detect problems with patients' mechanical ventilator function and the physiology at, at certain levels. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for watching. Please consider sharing your suggestions or comments with us at the email address listed. And please also continue to visit with us at our website and our YouTube channel. To be instantly notified of when we release new content, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel as well. Thank you.